Good afternoon. I would like to present to you all who are listening a homage to Dr. Francis Jackson, who was organist of York Minster from 1946 until 1982. And this man has, was probably one of the highest influences uh, of my uh, of my tender years as a schoolboy at St Peter's York. My first in, uh, experience of York Minster was in January 1973 uh, when I was in the choir of uh, St Peter's School York and we went to sing with the Minster Choir uh, for the Epiphany Procession and it was an incredible experience to uh, to process up both sides of the nave, uh, preceded by thurifers, uh with thurables belching clouds of incense, as we sang these hymns uh, to the baby, who had uh, who had revealed himself to the Gentiles, the Epiphany. The greatest, uh, uh, the second greatest feast of the year, only after Easter, and above Christmas, especially for the Orthodox. And as time went on, I uh, I continued to sing in the school choir, and I had organ lessons. I was always very interested in the organ from about the age of eight, and I had. Uh, some lessons with David Cooper who uh, went on to be a cathedral organist uh, afterwards uh, but there was only a, he was only there for about my first year at St Peter's and then uh, I had lessons with Keith Pemberton uh, who was a much more shall we say uh, plodding uh, persevering uh, very mild, very kind, but uh, was very clear about what he wanted in his pupils. And I had uh, uh, several years with Keith Pemberton as his pupil. Um, on Sunday afternoons we would, could uh, go out of the school and we could go exploring the city of York. And I explored many beautiful churches. I was particularly interested in the churches. All Saints North Street made a particular impression on me, which has been largely uh, uh, turned back into its uh, pre-Reformation state by Anglo-Catholics, but in a more English uh, uh, style rather than the Roman style, as you will find in, in many um, uh, Anglo-Catholic churches. Uh, another very interesting church I discovered was Holy Trinity Micklegate, and I found somebody playing the organ rather clumsily. And he was a rather sort of uh, jolly fellow, uh, with a with a with a broad Yorkshire accent, and his name was Eric Addy. And he was practicing for a service that he was going to play. And uh, so I got to know Eric Addy, and he uh, um, very much encouraged me to play the organ at uh, uh, a three manual um, hill organ at. Uh, Holy Trinity Micklegate, and he um, persuaded me to go uh, to, uh, to to join the choir of Holy Trinity because we only had to sing Sunday even song uh, at school, so I had to be in, uh, I had to be back at school for that. But on the Sunday morning we were free. Uh, we didn't we didn't have any call services on a on a Sunday morning in the in the chapel. Of course, the chapel did have um, have uh, non-compulsory services, but uh, um, in a rather more, shall we say, contemporary style. 
uh, whereas I preferred what I found at Holy Trinity Michael Gate. We'd have a, a sung Eucharist, uh, I think, three Sundays a month, and we'd have matins on the fourth Sunday. And uh, it was a nice middle of the road uh, um, church with a choral tradition and uh, uh, with the altar facing the uh, facing the east as it always had been um, so I, I, I sung in the in this choir and Eric also was involved with the York and District Organist Association so we uh, went off on trips and went organ crawling as other people go pub crawling we went organ crawling and we go and play different organs in various churches here there and everywhere and one day Eric took me to meet uh, a songman from York Minster Choir uh, we went up a little street near Monk Bar Monk Bar Court and uh, up there towards the end is uh, are some very small uh, cottages and the uh, and there was the first uh, the first cottage with a uh, with a little diamond shaped pane of glass uh, in the um, in the front door and we knocked on the door and uh, we were asked to come in and what an incredible sight I would behold um, in front on the other side of the room was the piano and then the wall there was, a, there was a big pile of woodbine cigarette packets uh, and uh, there was a telescope and there were boxes and boxes and boxes full of slides photographic slides uh, tapes and this enormous great tape recorder uh, the uh, the famous so-called gas driven paragraph and this was um, and this was the house of John Rotherer and John Rotherer um, I am convinced to this day that he uh, that he was one of these famous people with uh, with Asperger syndrome uh, uh, a variant on of uh, of autism which means uh, the brain, the human brain, the human mind working according to a different system rather like um, some computers work on Windows, others work on Macintosh um, and very often uh, an Asperger is uh, an Asperger person is able to uh, uh, do incredible things with the mind uh, and sometimes things that are not terribly useful, like uh, piling up old uh, woodbine uh, cigarette packets in the corner. Uh, well, I don't have any here, but I have. Uh, uh, that um, oh, John Rotherer. I had his fireplace, and he had his um, he had his teapot. I always had a always had a uh, a cup of tea on the on the on the on the brew and uh, he would have a few chairs around the fire and it was a very friendly very friendly place he was a very friendly friend very friendly man uh, despite his his amazing eccentricities and i suppose that is the um, the uh, the non-scientific definition of somebody with asperger's is uh, is being eccentric, the last of the great British eccentrics. And so there was a, um, the, where the piano was, there was an old uh, 1930s radio a wireless set. Of course, you called them the wireless, you called it the wireless in the old days, not the radio, it was the wireless. And it was a wooden, a wooden box about the height of this chair that I'm sitting on now. And that was in front of the piano, so you would sit on that. And in the corner, he had a, a big, uh, a big loudspeaker, a single loudspeaker, and he would uh, plug his ferrograph tape recorder into that, and he would play the the newest recordings he'd made. And 
he was uh, uh, he uh, maybe two of the things that most interested him was recording sound and taking photographs. Uh, he was also very keen on trams and trains. He taught me an awful lot about uh, about the Settle to Carlisle Railway and the the uh, the Royal uh, the Railway Museum in in York and the various steam locomotives that are still being preserved there. And this is very much this was very much uh, this was very much John's world. And I certainly appreciated these things too. I've uh, perhaps I'm a little bit less for, for trains than uh, than than boats. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I've gone on rather a long time about John Rothera. Uh but it was through John Rothera that I knew some of the most uh, intimate moments. Of Francis, uh, of Francis Jackson. Francis was a very reserved uh, person. Um, he was quite, um, he was quite aloof. Um, he uh, was very much of the mind that a young boy of 13 or 14 was seen and not heard, rather like his own choristers. Uh, a schoolboy knew his place, and that's perhaps something I was not very good at uh, as a schoolboy. Uh, so he did tend to rebuff me. The first piece I'm going to play uh, uh, this afternoon is the prelude, uh, the introduction and fugue by James Nares. And I do remember a time when I uh, would have been around about 1974-75. I, um, I, uh, I found um, Francis uh, going towards the little door under the uh, under the choir screen to go up to the uh, to the organ loft, and I, uh, I, I cried out, "Doctor Jackson!" And he turned his head and said, "Yes." Um, I said, "Could you tell me?" Uh, where I would find a copy of the Introductions and Fugues by James Nares. And he said to me, I, I think you'll find a copy in the British Museum. That was one of my first uh, uh, head-on meetings with, uh, w with Dr. Jackson. But it, they were so rare, he just seemed to tower uh, above me, so high. And it was only really through John that I would know, know much more about him. Um, John, of course, was quite a cheeky fellow. Um, there was uh, an organist uh, who I knew personally and who had been a pupil of um, uh, of uh, Francis Jackson. And I won't name this person because he's still alive and uh, he would certainly wouldn't appreciate me uh, mentioning his name in public. But John uh, asked uh, um, Fran Francis, uh, uh, could you, w w what do you think is uh, such and such, uh, uh, ACDC, uh, and Francis said, I, I don't think he's any kind of C at all, but I'm sure he's the epitome of discretion. Bye. And these, uh, it seems, it must seem to be very impertinent for, of me to, uh, to try to imitate such uh, a a towering man, but uh, these mannerisms, I caught a few and they remain graven in my memory and one day they will be completely forgotten. We don't know anything about uh, Bach's mannerisms or 
um, or what uh, what Brahms was like as a, as a person. We know these composers and great men of the past uh, through their music. But I'm very much aware of uh, almost being one of the last links in a in a in a kind of tradition in a in a kind of community. Um, these uh, I've only mentioned two of these little anecdotes. Uh, there's also another rather rather cheeky one is the uh, it, the in the north side in, in the north quiet aisle there's a toilet where the gentlemen of the choir can go and uh, and have a jimmy riddle before they uh, before they go to uh, to the choir vestry to uh, to get robed up for even song and there was uh, there was john rotherer who was uh, standing at the urinal and francis came along and uh, John seemed to be rather um, concerned uh, about uh, not uh, getting his underpants dirty. And Francis uh, said this, They say, if you shake it more than twice, you're playing with it. Well, a little bit under the belt, but Francis had been in the army. He'd served during the war. He'd been with uh, some a great uh, variety of men, and he'd had experience of life. Uh, in a hundred and four years, not many of us will live that long. Very few, very few men do. I just, I just have nothing but uh, admiration. Uh, perhaps he was like a, he was like a, he was to me like what uh, some rock stars are to uh, to other young people now of uh, of school age. I suppose he, I was one of his fans. I uh, uh, strangely enough, I listened to him uh, a recording of him playing the the Basto Sonata in E flat, and as I listened to the music, I felt my life of the the mid 1970s I was not very well in myself uh, for many things I was still looking for my own identity I was still looking for what things meant and I could feel those feelings that I had in those days through this piece that I was listening to again. And Francis's passing has marked another cut-off point in my life, a little bit like when my mother died in 2013. It, uh, my childhood had, had gone. Mein junges Leben hat ein End. My young life has an end. And this is something that we all go through unless we, uh, unless we die young. So Francis has, uh, this is one thing that we will find with, uh, with old age and wisdom, especially a man who lived 104 years uh, I haven't seen him since uh, since the 1970s when he was still when he was still here at, at his post at York Minster. And then I went away and I lived my life. But yet, the old imitations of John Rotherer and Eric Adder, Eric Adder tempted to be an imitator. And maybe not a very healthy tendency. He imitated John Rotherer, he imitated Francis Jackson, he imitated a lot of other people I'd met in those days. All part of a young man, uh, as I was, uh, so, uh, in contact with these people a lot older than myself, 
sometimes it wasn't very easy to uh, distinguish my own identity from theirs. This is another one of great uh, of life's great lessons. So I will now go ahead and play a number of pieces. Uh, I get to play the uh, the introduction and fugue in F by James Nares. Uh, finally, I didn't have to go to the British Museum. Oxford University Press uh, uh, published uh, uh, published this book here, uh, but unfortunately, the uh, uh, it's it's all in uh, facsimile, and uh, facsimile music. I'll hold it a little bit closer to the camera, just as a, just as a, just as a sample. It's not easy to read. So I managed to find a, uh, find a, another little edition of uh, a privately uh, uh, printed edition of uh, of Nas' uh, uh, introduction and fugue in F, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, so I don't have to decipher uh, because what we are used to is notes that are played together are, are above and under each other in a vertical line and in these scores from the 18th century uh, they can be anywhere in the bar uh, it's just the value of the note that tells you where the note comes and that, it's, uh, that involves quite a lot of mental calculation. Um, just before going on about this program, what I have chosen is not Francis's own music, most of which is far too difficult for me to play. Uh, I don't really like all of it. Um, he's quite close in many ways to Benjamin Britten. Uh, Benjamin Britten was a brilliant composer but not one I particularly like just a question of taste De gustibus non is disputandum but so I've opted for some of the music that uh, that Francis liked and that he played, and this is not too challenging for somebody of limited technique like myself. Uh, so I have chosen some uh, 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 some early 19th century and 18th century music, and even some 17th century, and two English composers from the uh, uh, from the period between the, the world wars, so uh, um, over Francis's age. Um, but they each have a story. Uh, William Harris was organist of uh, St George's Chapel, Windsor, and uh, he wrote some charming little pieces uh, generally quiet pieces and one of them was the prelude in E flat which he wrote inside the church <coughs> in the 19th uh, in the 1930s um, he um, some somehow got to um, uh, uh, got to Leipzig and went into the church where Bach had been the organist in the la in the latter part of his life. And he wrote this little prelude, clearly inspired by Bach, but also clearly original. And I think uh, and Francis also went to Weimar, sat outside the church with a friend of his, and composed a piece also inspired by Bach and I think he did so because uh, because uh, uh, because Harris had done so so many years before and it's not plagiarism it's just that we do follow each other this is something that's called tradition 
this is uh, this is something being being human we are inspired by by those who came before us and so i will play this prelude in e flat uh, the third is going to be uh, by Orlando Gibbons, uh, a voluntary in A minor. Uh, certainly Francis would have played it either on the organ or on the harpsichord. Um, I, well, I played it on the organ, I played it without, the, uh, without all the interminable uh, ornaments, the trills and uh, inverted, uh, um, uh, um, inverted mordants and uh, various uh, devices like that. I find it sounds a lot cleaner, so it does need uh, a much better phrasing than it would get on the on the harpsichord. Um, fourthly, George Oldroyd was organist of uh, um, oh dear, the church in Croydon, big Anglo-Catholic church in Croydon. I'm afraid I've lost the the, um, the dedication of this church, but it's the the big Anglican Anglo-Catholic church in Croydon, um, and he wrote three liturgical preludes. And he once this is this is another little story that that came from John Rothera. Uh, he um, George Oldroyd confided in in Francis that. Uh, Whenever I compose a piece, I always say a little prayer. Francis said, Yes, it sounds like it too. Just think of that. Just, just, just think about that. In a certain way, he, uh, he, um, he couldn't stand uh, religious hypocrisy. Francis was very critical about people being holier than thou. For Francis, also for Priscilla, who was, uh, I'm not sure if she actually was a Quaker, but she was very close to Quakerism in her, in her belief and, uh, um, and, uh, and in her life, that um, Christianity is something we, we live within ourselves. And sometimes we need to be silent and to keep within ourselves. And I think that little, yes, it, it sounds like it too. It, it's almost a reproach, very, very mildly said, very gentle, but it was a reproach as far as I can understand it. I don't think I would have liked to have been on the receiving end of such words myself. That's Francis. He was able to. He, he was able to express himself so cuttingly, but in such a gentle, such a gentle way. The final piece is a concerto, the concerto number two in G minor by Matthew Camage, who was also one of Francis's uh, distinguished predecessors at the organ of York Minster. Uh, Matthew Camage uh, uh, lived uh, in the early 19th century and uh, would have uh, played on the old organ that was destroyed in 1829 by the, by the madman Jonathan Martin who set the uh, the choir and uh, the the choir stalls and the organ and the uh, and the uh, the choir vault on fire in 1829? Miraculously, the uh, the choir screen survived, but the organ didn't. Everything was destroyed. So what we see today, in, the, in terms of the choir stalls and the organ case, they were all built beautifully, exquisitely, in oak, in carved oak. They're all dated from 1829, 1830, uh, from the restoration of the York Minster Choir after the fire. 
So Matthew Cammage would have composed this piece um, for the minster organ as it was. So without any further ado. And now I've seated the organ. You will probably hear uh, some very different acoustics uh, because I've just uh, switched on on my computer uh, a piece of software called Reaper which gives um, something of an echo effect uh, which takes away from the dryness of uh, being in a private house. So I will now play uh, the James Nair's uh, introduction and fugue in F.
As promised, the next piece is the Credulity Flirt by William Harris, uh, composed in the Thomas Kirche in Leipzig in August 1931, just two years before Hitler came to power and when travel between England and Germany would have become much more difficult. the uh, uh, voluntary by Orlando Gibbons uh, so we now return to the uh, to the English Renaissance um, um, a little bit uh, suggestive of Talis but uh, written a little after Talis and it's that rather melancholy uh, atmosphere of the 16th century in all those terrible years when Catholicism was rooted out and uh, replaced by the uh, by the reformed liturgy and parish life uh, under Cranmer.
this next piece is the uh, what uh, Francis would have considered a little bit of pious mush from George Oldroy, which is in fact a rather charming little piece. Uh, so when Francis said to, to him, when, when Oldroy said, I never composed without saying a little prayer, and Francis said to him, yes, and it sounds like it too, as if to say, stop preaching at me. But here's the piece. Kemich's uh, um, 
concerto in G minor. Uh, Matthew Kamich, um, he was organist um, at York Minster. Oh gosh. No, no, they, they, they can't do blood that long. Um, he lived from 1774 to 1844 and he held the post of organist of York Minster from 1803 to 1842. Uh, so uh, he obviously retired just, uh, oh, yes, here we are. It's uh, the, the, uh, the, the reason he was incapacitated by paralysis. Uh, the organ at the time, uh, before it was destroyed by Jonathan Martin, uh, was a three manual, um, had quite a lot of stops, including mixtures and a cornet on the braid, and uh, it had a choir organ with a flute and a fifteenth and a bassoon, and a swell organ with, uh, with a diapason chorus and principal, the cornet and a trumpet, and uh, uh, there, were, there was a pedal board, but there were no pedal pipes. Uh, just had a couple of, rather like this organ has, it's just a, the, the, the pedal notes only play the, the correspondo notes on the manual. There are no pi pipes on the pedal. So uh, very similar, very similar kind of organ as many organs were in those days in England. So here's the concerto number two in G minor. <coughs> 